will understand. I'm sure he would understand. Well, it's the fourth week of um, Advent, uh, and I know you've been uh, looking at the various themes of faith and joy and hope, and this morning, uh, the fourth one of, of love. And as we read in Romans 5, you've been looking at that uh, each uh, morning this this month, and I couldn't believe it. You invite a speaker to come and speak to you when you're already experts in the passage, having had it three weeks in a row. But uh, I'm sure we'll find something for us to think about. And it's a wonderful passage, isn't it? A wonderful passage. It's rich with gospel truth. It's full of encouragement for us. And it's centered on Jesus Christ. And what a better place to be than uh, for Christmas 2022 to be centering our thinking on Jesus Christ. Well, of course, one of the the greatest joys uh, in life is is to be loved. Loved loved for who we are. Loved in spite of who we are, perhaps. Did you know that when we're in love or when we're loved, it causes our heart rate to increase? Our face begins to glow. Uh, Our lips look a little bit more red. Um, Our eyes shine a bit brighter. Are you feeling it? And of course, the love is felt in in, in our hearts. It's expressed in our thoughts and imaginations. Uh, When we are spoken to or when we read something, we perhaps get a sense of being loved. Perhaps various different actions and gestures people make towards us remind us that we're loved. And of course, it's all reflected in our our songs and our our ballads, and it's reflected in uh, books and in stories and uh, film and TV and in paintings and sculpture. A whole world is covered with this theme of love. You know, I could do a whole sermon on uh, songs with love mentioned in it. Did you know that 60% of modern songs are all about love? All about love. It completely dominates our thinking. You'll be glad I'm not going to sing any of them of you, but love is all around. Love is all around. And of course, the red heart is that sort of universal symbol of love because it's very deep. It's very close to life itself. It's very much part of our being to be loved, to be loved. And love can bring us great highs. Our desires are satisfied and our appetites are fulfilled and our admiration is won. It brings such a richness to life to be loved. I trust that you have some experience of of, of love uh, in your life. Maybe the closeness of, of a spouse. Maybe... Uh, sort of the enduring loyalty of parents who never let go. Maybe you have children who are devoted to you and look after you. Maybe you know that sense of that bond that's forged in, in, in serving or playing in a team. Maybe you know of just the constancy of a friend, a friend who always will give the telephone call, will always come around for a coffee, a friend who's always there. That sense of being loved brings great highs, but it it can also bring great lows. It's agonizing by its removal or by its absence, or if love is not returned in any way. To not find love, to be ignored, to be rejected, to be told you're not loved, that you were never loved, in fact, that you're hated. That's hard. Of course, there's many songs about the painful side of love. Have you got a few that you know? I'm not going to sing them. You'll be glad to know. But uh, you've lost that love and feeling. There's one. I'll just throw one out. You can tell how old I am by the choice of the songs, can't you? Of course, we find it easier to love people who like us. And also we find it easier to love people who are like us in character, in interests, etc. But everyone else, it's all just a little bit harder. But you see, human love, you know, as, as you, I don't need to tell you, and the last thing you want from this morning is to come for me to give you some sort of cod philosophy on love. 
But human love fails. It's temporary. It's weak. It's imperfect. And that's why it's good to come uh, this morning to think about God's love instead. Because God's love is perfect. And it's strong. And it lasts forever. And it does last forever. There's two passages of Scripture which I want you to take away with you because I'm going to refer to them quite a lot this morning. 1 John chapter 4. I hope you'll read it over your lunchtime. And then Romans chapter 8 right at the end. But 1 John chapter 4 says this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And then the, the, the statement, the declaration that God is love. That God sets a standard for love. He is the very definition of love. It goes on. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through love. So this is Christmas. This is love. That God sent his son, his one and only son, into the world. It was a love which he didn't keep to himself. He didn't reserve it for other heavenly beings, but he's shown it to people like you and me. It's a love which is given, poured out. Perhaps you'll sing this evening, I don't know, in the bleak midwinter. It's uh, quite a well-known, we are, quite a well-known carol by a lady called Christine, uh, Christina Rossetti. She wrote another one, which I quite like. Come, says this, love came down at Christmas. Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, star and angels gave the sign. Worship we the Godhead, love incarnate, love divine. Worship we are Jesus, but wherewith for sacred sign. Love shall be our token, love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and all men, love for plea and gift and sign. What she's capturing in that is that the birth of the Lord Jesus was God's declaration of love. Displayed and in human form. Incarnate means in the flesh, in person. God who could be seen and who could be touched and heard and spoken. This spectacular gift of God's love. For each one, Christina Rossetti says, means it causes us to worship God and love him and love others too, as we've been thinking about already. Well, coming to our passage in Romans 5, I just want us to look at three things. God's love demonstrated, God's love experienced, and God's love guaranteed. Let's read uh, verses um, 6 to 8 again. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is is demonstrated, has been demonstrated What's, what is he saying? He's saying, here is proof of God's love. That the Lord Jesus died for sinners. You see, love is not just a noun. It's not just a feeling either. Love is a verb. It's action. It happens. And here we get an expression of what God thinks of us. Well, he thinks of us in love. And here we get some idea of how does he measure that love. Well, it can't really be measured but we can touch it it's tangible and it's costly and the extent of God's love is here is demonstrated by the costliness of the love of the gift and the unworthiness of the recipients think about it God didn't just send an angel or some other heavenly being to demonstrate his love he sent his one and his only son the Lord Jesus. Remember those verses from 1 John 4? This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And you see, God's not paying us uh, something that we deserve. 
He's not paying us wages. He's not rewarding our efforts. He's not honoring mankind's wonderfulness. But he's freely giving the gift of his son. I'm sure we, all of us perhaps can quote John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. He so loved you and me. It was so deep. It was so strong that he gave, that he gave up, that he gave his one and only son. The costliness of the gift, the costliness of the gift demonstrates how deep his love is. I've got three sons. I guess I wouldn't give any of them up. And many of you know things which are very precious to you. But God gave his own son, his one and only son. And God didn't just send his uh, son into the world to show us how to live and to, to teach us nice things. But he gave him up to die on a cross, on a cruel cross, to be hated and to be rejected. This was no self-serving love or self-fulfilling love, which is so common in 21st century UK. No, this is self-giving love and self-sacrificing love. It's real love. It's deep love. This historical event of Jesus coming into the, the, the world is genuine proof that God loves us. The enormous cost of his love, the the amazing quality of his love is all demonstrated by how costly this act was. And 1 John 4, when you read it over your lunchtime, it also says God sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It wasn't just the fact that by dying on the crest, cost, he proved how much he loved us. More than that, he dealt with our failure and our sin and our error and our iniquity and our trespass and all those things he dealt with it by paying the price uh, for our sin on the cross and that again demonstrates the fact uh, how deep he loves how deep he loves and it was at that point where his perfect love but also his perfect justice met together he dealt with sin because he hates sin but he demonstrates that he loves us because his love is perfect but think on the other side in, in this passage here, how unworthy are the recipients, you and I, of, of this love. The picture is painted of mankind, and it's a pretty ugly picture in a serious state without God. When mankind, when we need uh, saving and delivering, God acted in love just at the right time. He intervened into history, all part of his plan. And no matter how highly we think of ourselves, our ingenuity, our skills, our education, our accomplishments, our resources, none of those things can save us. But God still acted in love. It tells us when we were powerless and when we were weak, what did God do? He acted in love. When we were ungodly, when we were rebellious, hostile towards him, refusing to submit to him, to love him, to worship him, to serve him and to follow him, what did God do? He acted in love to such people as this. And you and I are probably all of these, if not many of them. God acts in love. When we were sinners, and who of us cannot say that we're not a sinner? When we've missed God's standards, even inadvertently, if not deliberately. When we've broken his law and ignored his commandments. What does God do? He acts in love towards us. And even if we think we're righteous, and if we think we're good, and if we think we're morally okay, and we're certainly less so than we think, what does God do? He acts in love. We may be flawed. We may be broken. We may be undeserving. We may think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We may be pretty unlovely. But rest assured, we're still loved. Now, some of you who know me know that I'm not a particularly sentimental sort of person. Coming from the north, you know, it doesn't, doesn't play with, the, uh, with how we were brought up. But I have kept one cuddly toy from my childhood. 
this cuddly toy is exactly one year younger than me, so it's 50 and something plus years old. It's pretty small, it's a panda. It used to be black and white, it's now black and gray. It's had several face lifts, shall we say, because the face was rubbed off or bitten off or chewed off. And I had an elder brother and he was pretty violent towards my loved uh, cuddly toy. It's been through the wash a few times. It's coming apart at the seams. There's, that, that cuddly toy deserves nothing. It should have been scrapped years ago, as, as most of my family say so. But the fact is, it's loved, and it's loved only by me. Nobody else in the whole world. It's a, it's a, it's a ragged thing. It certainly shouldn't be scrapped. It's special. It's love. There's no reason for it. It's completely irrational. I'm embarrassed talking to you about my cuddly toys. But I just want to demonstrate the fact that no matter how crazy it might seem, it's loved. And yet, no how much crazy it might be, no matter what sort of people we are or have been, we're loved. We're loved by God, and that's demonstrated at Christmas. Why? Because God sent His Son. Some of you have probably read uh, a book by uh, Philip Yancey called What's So Amazing About Grace. Great sentence in there. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing uh, we can do to make God love us less. And it's true. It's true. We're loved. We're loved. Not that justice doesn't matter. Not that sin doesn't matter. They do matter. But just get that theme of God loving us. We sang, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It's uh, uh, earlier this morning, that's a song by uh, Charles Wesley. And uh, he was a very religious sort of guy uh, through school and, and university. But he opened up a book one day and somebody was explaining the, the book of Galatians 2. And, 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 a, and a verse from Galatians 2 just, just struck him. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And despite all his religiosity and his upbringing, he just got it. The Son of God loved him and gave himself for him. Well, I want to pass on some of that, uh, that, that passion for the fact that God loves you and he loves me. Do you realize it? Do you live in the good of it? We've shared communion together and uh, reminds us again how much God loved us. We realize our need. We realize the, the purpose of the cross. We know that our sins have to be dealt with. We know that he wants to give us life, life as it really should be lived. He loves us. He loves us. Well, let's read verses 3 and 5 again, because this, is, I think, describes God's love experienced. And not only so, he says, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. It's interesting, this bit of the, 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 the chapter, because God's love is being spoken of in the context of suffering. And certainly the Christians at that time who were being written to in, in Romans were experiencing some suffering, perhaps being persecuted directly. Some of them had been thrown out of their, where they had lived, and they, they were refugees, essentially. And that would be on top of the normal challenges that you and I face in terms of trouble with work and trouble with our health and, and trouble with the, in the family and all the other sufferings that we might experience. But Paul, the writer here, he sees some positives in suffering. And that's a hard thing to say. He sees some positives in suffering. Because suffering builds perseverance. And perseverance builds character. And character builds hope. And hope is underpinned by the fact that God is just pouring out his love into our lives by the Holy Spirit. And it's often that until we go to periods of suffering that we don't understand and experience how much God loves us. The emphasis here 
in that pouring out is on God's generosity. This, the lavishness of it, the extravagance of it, the boundlessness we were thinking about earlier before. Use all the adjectives you can describe. You're never going to get to the, the full extent of it. It's a, vi- a very a vivid image of this pouring out of God's love. It demonstrates the fact that God is good. That God really does care. That he really does know about our lives. So what does he do in the, when we're in our extremities? He pours out of his, his love by the Holy Spirit into our lives. He's got a love which will never let go. A, a love which will never give us up. It's the basis of our hope and, the, and the, the underpinning of our hope is that God loves us. Every day, we can be assured of God's love. And so God's love keeps us going. When suffering and trouble and hardship come, God's love will keep us going. His love is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I was thinking of uh, the, the, the children of Israel. You remember them? Children of Israel back in the Old Testament. They were coming out of Egypt and were going through the desert into the, into the promised land, and they had a 40-year journey to go through. But this was an opportunity for them to experience God's love in their hardship and in their suffering. You know, um, God explained to them in the beginning of Deuteronomy that God had chosen them and that he had loved them, not because they were a big nation. In fact, he said they were quite small and quite insignificant. But he loved them because he loved them. And he was going to love them for a thousand generations. Now, I don't think that meant literally a thousand generations, but just something beyond their thinking. He was going to keep loving them on and on and on. And he poured out his extravagant love for them because he fed them in the wilderness with manna and quail and with water. He looked after them. He guided them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He protected them from the hostility of the surrounding nations. He poured out his love on this insignificant uh, group of people because he did. And he demonstrated his love in the hardship and the experiences of everyday life. I think of the, the life of the Lord Jesus too. He gave people an experience, a, a, an understanding of what, it, what God's love it looks like. He ministered to the people who were broken uh, and the failures. He touched uh, the, uh, the untouchable people. He forgave those who were deemed to be the worst sinners, although we know we're all sinners. He forgave them and gave them second chances. He had particular concern for, for, for the vulnerable, for, for widows and for children and for those who were grieving uh, at, at times of, of, of death and loss. God's love is poured out through the person of the Lord Jesus in how he behaved. He demonstrated God's love so that they could experience God's love in, in everyday life. I don't know if you've heard of a, a lady called Annie Flint. Uh, she lived uh, about uh, 150, 200 years ago in, in the U.S. Um, her mother died when she was three, um, giving birth to her, her little sister. And that's the last uh, memory she had of her, of her mother, uh, just giving birth to her, her sister. Her father died a, a, few, uh, a few years later. She was fostered by a, a kind uh, family, but both of her foster parents died pretty much soon after. She decided she'd become a, a teacher and loved teaching, but she got arthritis in her, in her 20s, and, and she had to give up her teaching. She could barely walk. She worried the whole of her life about um, the medical bills that she had to face. But she wrote this, her steadfast faith in God, he gives more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sends more strength when the labors increase to added affliction. He adds his mercy to multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth, and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, and the day is half done, 
When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, he gives, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. God's love is demonstrated and experienced, particularly in, in trouble. I long that you and I we might be able to experience that. Suffering's never easy. It is the opportunity for our faith to grow and to be strengthened and, and, and to be deepened. And perhaps we shouldn't, it's easy to say, be so worried about what we're going through, but worried more so about who we are and accepting God's love, being content to know that we're loved and that our hope is interpinned in that way. Let me just read quickly verses 9 to 11. Just there, the last point, God's love being guaranteed since we have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Well, many of you have spotted that there's no direct reference to love in those verses. But with a little bit of uh, preacher's license, I go forth very briefly. You see, what, what I think the reasoning is, is going like this. If God should give his uh, son and show his love by giving his son... And he did that when we were far off, when we were enemies and hostile. How much better it's going to be that he's going to treat us and love us when we're reconciled in that peace. It's, it's, a, it's a figure of speech which Jesus used and which Paul also uses. This how much more. If this, if this has happened, then how much more, something that we can't probably get our heads around. But if, if we've seen this, then how much more is God going to act if that were the case? If God could do that, send Jesus, he can certainly do this, bring us through uh, to salvation. If he could do the difficult thing, sending his son, showing his love, dying on the cross, dealing with sin, how much more should we trust him to see us through? If he allowed the Lord Jesus' life to be given up as an act of love when we were his enemies. Well, how much more will we be saved from the judgment or the wrath, it says there, over sin? It's, it's, it's a way of, I suppose it's a, it's a bit of rhetoric, isn't it? It's a bit of a way of describing. But how much more, if God did this, if God demonstrates his love in sending Jesus, if God pours out his love by the Holy Spirit into our lives, then we can absolutely be guaranteed that if he's done all that, he's going to be looking after us into the future. His love is going to continue. He's going to save us. He's going to make sure that sin doesn't get any, and the judgment for sin doesn't get its arms around us. It, it's reminding us God's dependable. We can stake our lives on him. We can stake our, his love and, and be, be guaranteed of it. I said the other chapter you ought to be reading over lunch is Romans chapter 8, just at the end. And Paul returns to the theme, and he asks five rhetorical questions, including ending uh, with, with one about God's love. He says this, who shall oppose us? Well, he's saying, well, nothing. Nothing can frustrate God's purpose. God is for us. And the second one is, what will he not give us? Well, no, nothing can quench God's generosity. He, I mean, he didn't even spare his own son. And then the third and the fourth, who can accuse us? Who can condemn us? Well, no one can accuse or condemn God's people because he's already justified, he made them justified because of Christ. He's already dealt with their sin because of Christ. And then the last one, what can separate us from God's love? Well, no, nothing. Nothing can separate us from God's love since he's revealed it in Jesus. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, it says? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love is guaranteed. I don't think Paul could have written it any other way, but just to say there's nothing that can separate us from God's love going on and on and on. Well, here we are, the fourth week of Advent. God's love has been demonstrated in the past. He sent his son Jesus, came as a baby at Christmas, but at Easter, died on the cross for you and I. God's love can be experienced in the present, particularly in suffering, because that's, at that point, God pours out his love by the Holy Spirit. God's love is guaranteed into the future, absolutely guaranteed. If he's already done all of this, we can be absolutely rock solidly sure that his love is going to continue on. Well, we're going to sing now, uh, so I think we need to call up those who are going to help us. I'll let you introduce it.